Hello, church family. Well, it's uh, time for another uh, Bible study in Romans. I'm sort of roaming around trying to find a great place to uh, do do the, the video. And, and so it's been so hot here in Arizona that I decided to go to Colorado. And guess what? I mean, there's two storms coming together there, and there's a pretty good chance there might be snow. So I'm hoping to be cooled off. But we're in Romans chapter 10 this time, and so I just wanted to mention uh, a couple of things about it. You're, you're familiar with salt and pepper, which usually go together, usually pass them around at the same time. But in restaurants nowadays, I mean, because we're doing this during the COVID-19 thing, you, you don't get those salt and pepper shakers. They, they give you individual ones. But generally speaking, we just like, you know, to pass pass them around. There are lots of things like that that go to go together. For example, uh, cap and gown, if you're going to graduate, or cookies and milk, or uh, there's all kinds of things that are pairs like that. And one of the pairs in Scripture that is interesting has to do with God's sovereignty and man's free will. We don't know quite how they work because the Bible never quite describes where the two cross, but we know that there's some of both. And so we've been talking about God's sovereignty and how he has total sovereignty about things. And so today in chapter 10, we're going to talk about our responsibility. We have some responsibility, some things that we're supposed to do. And so that's what we're going to talk about. So join me in a couple of minutes and uh, we'll uh, look at Romans chapter 10. Welcome. Uh, glad you came to this uh, uh, Bible study on Romans chapter 10. So we've been talking about uh, God's sovereignty over over the last couple of weeks, times, and um, this time, this chapter is really has to do with our responsibility. We have some free will and some things that God holds us responsible for doing, and so we're going to talk about that uh, today. But I, I would like to remind you about the the sovereignty of God by uh, reading this verse, which is really back in Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 29 and 30, where Paul said, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And so... Um, the, He's, he's mentioned these five, the, the five words. First one was foreknew. He knew about us at the very, from the very beginning because he's God and he knew what he was going to do. And then he predestined us. He planned for us to become a part of his family. But then when we were actually on this earth, he called us, which means he made it possible for us to be interested in pursuing God. He he just made a, a change and certain things happened and it sort of called us to look at him. And then when we accepted Christ as our Savior, he justified us, made us just as if we'd never sinned. He, he declared that our sin was gone. And then one of these days, he's going to glorify us. He's going to take us to heaven where everything will be extraordinarily wonderful and perfect. So salvation is what God does. It's all him. But unless we decide we're not interested in which case, then it's all us, uh, not, no salvation. And so here in chapter 10, we're going to look at our responsibility in uh, the Christian life and in, in salvation too, for that matter, because Paul's going to give a little uh, mini uh, description of accepting Christ. So here's the, the, first, uh, the first verse in Romans chapter 10, which is verse 1, obviously, uh, where it says, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for the Israelites that they may be saved. And, and so, see, Paul is describing something here, something that he is doing, that he has chosen to do, that he thinks will make a difference in the Israelites becoming Christians. And so salvation is all from God, that's true, but now he's describing some of the things that are our responsibility. And so he's praying for his friends, for the Israelites, because he thinks what he does will have some... Uh, uh, some uh, thing that God will do. It will help God to make the, the decision to bring them into the kingdom. And so he expects an answer from God. Well, and then in Romans uh, 10.4, he says this, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Now, 
I always found this interesting. Christ is the end of the law because Christ is the one who brings righteousness to anybody. That's the way it is. The law is there not to help us become righteous. It's there to show us that we're not righteous. And it's there to show us that God is holy and that he is righteous. And so it's we have a total inability to become righteous on our own. Even if we try to obey the whole law, it's not going to happen. But to gain God's righteousness, Jesus' righteousness, what we have to do is put our faith in Jesus Christ. And so, and then in verse 3, Paul said this, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God, he's talking about the Jewish people, since they did not, the Jewish people did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own by obeying the law, they did not submit to God's righteousness. And so, this is a clue for why the Jews missed um, coming to Jesus. They missed uh, the Messiah. They tried to obey the law. They found, but they couldn't. They couldn't obey it. They tried and tried and tried, even though some of them thought they did, and some of them even in Scripture announced that they thought they had obeyed the law, but, but they didn't. But there's no righteousness for anybody uh, in the law. It has to be apart from the law, and it only comes through Jesus Christ. And it comes in a way with a particular word that is used for submit. He used that word here. They did not submit to God's righteousness. If we want God's righteousness, we have to submit to it too by humbling ourselves, repenting of our sin, and asking Jesus Christ to become a part of our life and believing in him. And so, and then Paul goes on in verses 9 and 10, which to explain really how this all works. He, sa he says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And so what we have to do first is to um, submit to God. We have, and that's an attitude. We have to change our attitude about not, sub being, not submitting to God or being rebellious toward God. We have to decide that we're willing to submit to him. It's like uh, humbling ourselves, surrendering ourselves, very much like Paul talks about in Romans 12, 1, which we'll discuss later. Uh, but he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice. Now, the word uh, sacrifice there means a dead animal that has been put on the altar for God. And the word before it, living, means it's an alive dead animal, which is sort of like an oxymoron. And the whole idea is we are sub becoming like a sacrifice. We're allowing God to crucify us and we're surrendering everything that we are to him. And so that's our true worship. We'll spend more time on that. But we also, have the, after submitting, we have to believe in our heart. We have to believe uh, what God has said, that Jesus was raised from the dead. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it says you will be saved. That's, that's what it takes. And when you're saved, that means you are justified. So when you believe, God justifies you. He declares you to not have any sin anymore. And then the, the, the thing, and, and so that's a belief. So we start out with an attitude, which is submit. Then we have a belief, which is we believe that God raised him from the dead. And then there's an action. We have to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. And that's how we gain salvation. We submit, we believe, and we confess. And then Paul goes on to say in Romans 10, verse 11, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. We won't have any shame in our life because we have obtained salvation. We've become a part of God's family. And then in verse 13, he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's interesting how easy it is to become a Christian, but it means we have to change our attitude by submitting to him. We have to change our belief by believing in Jesus Christ, and then we have to confess to him our sin, that we have committed sin, we know we've committed sin, and we want his forgiveness for us. And, but he's perfectly willing to, uh, to do that, to bring us into his family. And so we discover 
that the majority of those Jewish people, those Israelites, were really lost because they were trying to gain salvation on their own. They were trying to obey the law. That's what they had chosen to do. And isn't it true that many people in today's world are in the very same boat? I mean, isn't that what everybody else, if they have not accepted Christ as their Savior, they're still trying to do enough good to stay out of hell or to get into heaven. And, people, and the truth is, people sin because they want to. We want whatever it is that is sinful. We want it, and so we go do it because, well, we have a sin nature. We've talked about that. Even though God foreknew all of these folks, even though he predestined them, to become a part of his family, and even though he called them to become a part of his family, people have a part in whether they receive salvation or not. They can say yes or no, I'm not interested, or yes, please, I'm interested in that. And so we as Christians have a responsibility, actually, and it sort of shows up in uh, uh, verses 14 and 15 where Paul writes this. How then can they, meaning anybody who's not a Christian, has, isn't a believer, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them or proclaiming to them? And how can anyone proclaim unless they are sent? And so he sort of set out a, uh, you know, a, a, a way of this happening. And it's, it's in the reverse order that's in this verse. For example, the first thing that has to happen is somebody either has to go or be sent. They have to go to talk to somebody. It may not even be that you go to a different country or a different city. It could be you just go across the street. Or it could be you just meet somebody in line at Walmart and you begin a conversation. You feel like that's a divine opportunity. And so then you can proclaim the truth to them, everybody can say something about what God means to them so that they can hear. Because when they begin hearing, God uses that in their heart along with his calling to bring them to the place where they get to make a decision. They get to decide, am I going to believe in this, in God or not? And then when they, if they do believe, they call on his name and guess what? He gives them salvation just like that, because he wants everyone to be saved, he says. And then in verse 17, here's what Paul says. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. And so when we talk to people about Christ, about what he means to us, how our life has changed, why we love him, what he has done for us, when we just mention those things, God uses that in their heart. They hear the message. The Holy Spirit does something, and faith comes to them. And that has to do with God has called them, and it all works together because we're doing our part so that they hear this thing, and then they can make a decision to believe, and then guess what? They'll call on the Lord and ask for his forgiveness. And so we can talk about our faith in all kinds of different levels. Sometimes it's how I got saved. Sometimes it's what God did this week. Sometimes it's what I'm praying about. It's all, I mean, whatever it is that we're going through in our Christian life, we never know what, whether what we talk about will help them or not. And oftentimes the Holy Spirit leads us to say something that we have no idea that this person is dealing with that exact same thing. And so we want to allow God to do that in us. So here's the big idea. God has provided everything it takes for someone to receive salvation. He expects us to share the gospel so people can hear, so they can believe, and so they can call on the name of the Lord. That's part of what, that's what God expects. And I found this uh, passage in Ezekiel, which is um, sort of uh, troubling in some ways, but I, I've I just thought you might be interested in seeing it. Here's what Ezekiel said. When I say, this is God speaking, when I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But 
If you do not warn the wicked person and they do not turn from their wickedness or from their evil ways, they will uh, die for their sin, but you will have saved yourself. So God wants us to warn people. If we warn people who, who are far from God, then he will not hold us responsible. But we have neighbors around us who we have conversations with, and we have interesting conversations sometimes with people in Walmart or wherever we go. God wants us to speak a good word for him. God has always held his people responsible for telling about his kingdom. And uh, he was upset at the Jewish nation because he held them responsible for telling people about him, but they chose not to do it. They made other decisions. So our responsibilities, here are some of them, to accept Christ as our Savior. If you have never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you need to do that. You need to believe. Put your faith in him. Trust in him. And call on his name and ask him to forgive you so that you can be a part of his family. If you've never done that, do that. And if you don't know how, call me. I will be happy to help you uh, find out how to do it. It's very simple. And then the second thing, pick someone to be your one. I mean, there's one person that God might lay on your heart that should be the one that you pray for all the time, that you pray for. You pray that they will come to know the Lord. And then you also pray that God will open opportunities for you to talk to them. And guess what? When you're praying for them and you have a conversation with them, God often opens the door. They just ask a question and it just flows right into that. But I think God wants us to have one. And so I encourage you to put your one, write their, their name or initials on the Who's Your One banner in the worship center. I've written mine up there and several other people have too. Put their name up there and we'll pray for those folks so that uh, God will be working in their heart. Just like Paul prayed for the Israelites because he wanted them to become Christians. And then a, a third thing is um, uh, you might use the website uh, blesseveryhome.com. This is a website that gives you tools to become a light for Christ in your neighborhood. You can get to know your neighbors by name because they have the names of people in your neighborhood. And you'll receive options in emails if you're interested in that for how to pray for them every day. Pray for your neighbors. I mean, of all the things we might do for them, an easy thing is to lift them up in prayer. And this makes it so easy for you. So I encourage you to go to blesseveryhome.com and then look for opportunities to bless your neighbors. It's amazing how when people actually see Christians acting like Christians, they become interested in Christianity and becoming one because they, what they see in the news is not people, Christians, acting like Christians. They see Christians claiming to be Christians, not acting like Christians. And so I encourage you to do some things, some easy things that you might do to, to, to help them, to encourage them. I'm thinking that this pandemic might even be an opportunity for a dry run for us to learn how to work in difficult circumstances. My friends in China are under may, way more difficult circumstances, and they're, they're having to figure out how to be Christians in a, in, a, in a country where they don't want any Christians. And so maybe this is our opportunity to learn how to do that. And so this is a good, good chance to figure out how can we bless our neighbors in this kind of an opportunity. And then uh, can I encourage you to talk about your faith when you get an opportunity? And then invite your one to something. It could be a, your small group. It could be a party. It could be anything. Just invite them to something where conversation happens. <laughs> and I was talking to somebody just today who, who told me that they, they had invited somebody to a, a thing that they were doing, and this person hates Christians, did not want to have anything to do with God. And when he got home, his his wife is a Christian. He, when he got home, he said to her, you know, those Christians are pretty normal. Well, I don't know if that's great or not, but finding out that we're not the weird people that he thinks is a pretty good thing. And so we need to help people in our lives figure that out. So God has some responsibilities for us and for you. How are you going to deal with that? Are you willing to do whatever God lays on your heart, because he's going to.
Thanks for listening. I hope you have a great week.